Whose woods these are? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near. Between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. He gives his harness bells a shake to ask if there is some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of the easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely, dark and deep. But I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep and miles to go before I sleep. Folks, nice to be with you. Hope nobody's sleepy, because we got miles to go. So let's talk about the journey I'd like to take together over the next little while. First, we gather in a dark wood of modern epidemiology. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about the opportunities that have gotten lost in translation over recent decades. Let's consider how luminous the promise of lifestyle actually is to public health and the human condition. Examine the problem that has forestalled our progress for far too long. See if we can get some leverage with the right metaphors, namely levers and levies. Do what we can in our collective and righteous might to shift health from the road less traveled to a path of lesser resistance. And in the end, just maybe get out of the woods by seeing the forest through the trees. We begin, though, in that dark wood. It's a place where chronic disease kills people, where chronic disease takes both years from life and life from years. We talk about the leading causes of death in the United States, and for many years, indeed decades, we've been able to generate that list. The leading cause of death among both men and women is heart disease. Second leading cause of death is cancer. Third is stroke. Fourth is respiratory diseases. Fifth is diabetes. So it is. So it has been. And so for the foreseeable future it shall be. But in 1993, two preeminent epidemiologists, Bill Fagy and Mike McGinnis, published a seminal paper in the Journal of the American Medical Association entitled Actual Causes of Death in the United States. McGinnis and Fege thought to ask a question that perhaps we should have been posing all along. What's causing the diseases that are causing the deaths? What's causing the diseases that are taking years from life and life from years? Because diseases aren't really causes. Diseases are effects. Effects of what? What's causing them? So they analyzed the epidemiologic landscape of 1990, got their arms around this issue, wrestled it under control, and reached the conclusion that virtually all of the premature deaths in our country were attributable to a list of 10 factors which overwhelmingly each of us can control in our daily lives. And the full list of 10 need not concern us here this afternoon because it in turn was overwhelmingly dominated by just the first three entries. Tobacco use, dietary pattern, and physical activity. In 1990, tobacco was the leading cause of death in the United States, still is. Bad use of feet and forks followed closely behind. 80% of the action on the entire list of 10 was right there, just those first three. Which means 80% of the premature deaths we experience as a nation are attributable to those three things each of us has the capacity to control. Our daily use, if you will, of feet, forks, and fingers. This was the landscape in 1990. It's getting to be an old vintage. I trust you'd like your data fresher, and we have them. Ten years later, Ali Magdad and others at the CDC analyzed the same issue again, reaching substantially the same conclusion. Essentially, all that had changed over the span of the decade is the gap between tobacco as the number one cause of premature death and the combination of bad use of feet and forks as number two had narrowed. It had narrowed for one good reason, the strides we've made toward better tobacco control, and one bad, deteriorating use of our forks, degenerating use of our feet, worsening epidemics of obesity and diabetes. This then was the landscape in 2000. You may prefer your data fresher still, and we have them. 
2009, Earl Ford and colleagues working at the CDC published results of survey research conducted among 23,000 adults in and around Potsdam, Germany. And they asked these 23,000 people about four ostensible behaviors. They asked them, do you smoke, yes or no? Do you eat well, yes or no, habitual intake of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains? Are you physically active on a regular basis, yes or no? And is your weight optimally controlled? And I digress just momentarily to note that weight, of course, is not a behavior. Anybody in the room wake up today and decide what to weigh? Today I will weigh, poof, right? Now, weight is not a choice, it's not a behavior, it's an outcome. It's an outcome substantially influenced by behaviors, diet, physical activity, calories in, calories out, but not entirely controlled by those, right? Is it true that two people can eat the same, exercise the same, one gets fat, one stays thin? It's true. It's not fair, but it's true, right? Because there are other factors involved. Our ethnic heritage, genetic polymorphisms, our microbiome that we're hearing so much about these days, right? The, the bacteria that colonize our intestines. Weight is not a behavior. But I digress, back to Dr. Ford's study. So they asked about these four factors, and they compared the two ends of the spectrum. So they compared, I don't smoke, I eat well, I'm physically active, my weight is just about what it ought to be, to I smoke, eat badly, don't exercise, and my weight's out of control. These people had an 80% lesser likelihood of developing any major chronic disease over the course of their lives than these people. Flip the switch over here from bad to good on any one of these behaviors and the lifetime probability of any major chronic disease went down 50%, but fire on all four cylinders. And the lifetime probability of any major chronic disease, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, dementia, was reduced 80%. Imagine if the news were to break tomorrow, front page above the crease of whatever newspaper you like best, that there's a new drug available by prescription, stunningly free of side effects, shockingly inexpensive, available in bountiful supply, safe enough for children and octogenarians alike, and taken once daily for the rest of your life, it will reduce the likelihood of ever getting any serious chronic disease by 80%. What would you do first? Call your doc to get a prescription or call your broker to buy stock in the company that owns the patent? Both would be good ideas. You'd need all the money because you're going to live a very long time, right? But for the fact that there is no such pill, and in my opinion, there never will be any such pill. But lifestyle is exactly that medicine, and we've known about it since 1993 at least. If you happen, for any reason, not to like Potsdam, or prefer your data fresher still, these exact findings were replicated a couple years back by Kavavik et al. in a study in the UK, and more recently still by McCullough et al. here in the US. In essence, folks, what we have is a repetitive drumbeat in the peer-reviewed literature telling us over and over again of the incredible power of a short list of lifestyle factors we control over nothing less than our medical destinies. Nor is the beat of this drum consigned to its surface. Its resonance travels to our pith and marrow, to within the double helix of DNA itself. More than a decade into the dawn of the genomic age, if we bog down in the nature-nurture debate, we have cause for disappointment. Because although we've unraveled the genome, we have not found isolated genetic causes of serious chronic disease, and we certainly haven't found the off switches. So if we think that we are at war with the influence of DNA on destiny, we have cause for frustration. But the nature-nurture debate serves up a false choice, a false dichotomy, and something of a distraction as we contemplate what we can do in the world around us. Because the reality is we can nurture nature. In this study by my friend Dean Ornish and colleagues, they enrolled 30 men with early stage prostate cancer amenable to watchful waiting. No immediate treatment required, but Dr. Ornish and colleagues thought, well, we can do better than just watch and wait. While we're watching and waiting, let's give these men the benefit of lifestyle as medicine. Optimal, mostly plant-based diet, regular physical activity, obviously no tobacco, good sleep, stress mitigation, good social interactions, 
That's the important stuff right there, right? Feet, forks, fingers, sleep, stress, and love. Got that taken care of, after that, who cares? They took care of those things, right? And over a span of months, went on to study not so much the men and not so much the cancer in the men, but preferentially the genes in the men with the cancer. And what they found is that the lifestyle intervention took 500 cancer promoter genes and dramatically downregulated their expression, 50 cancer suppressor genes and dramatically upregulated their expression. The power of lifestyle is such that it can refashion our fate at the very level of our genes. And this study has been followed by many others just like it. It's a branch of the literature that's filling out fast. So I think the case can be made, and indeed dare hope the case has been made, that the master levers of medical destiny are not the tools of my trade as a physician, not the wares that are carried along the corridors of hospitals, such as the one I was in this morning. Nothing, frankly, at the cutting edge of biomedical advance. Nothing high tech, not SPECT or PET or MRI. The master levers of medical destiny were in our hands all along. Their feet, forks, and fingers. Used well, these three could reshape our fate. And you know I trust what Archimedes said about a lever. Give me one long enough and I can move the whole world. Make no mistake, these levers are long enough and should long since have served to move the whole world of modern epidemiology and public health to a better place. But, alas, much has been lost in translation. We like to say knowledge is power. Would that it were so. The gap between what we know and what we do with what we know belies that wishful thinking. So as we convene here this afternoon, aptly in a school of public service, the challenge for us all is to translate knowledge into power, to turn what we have known these 20 years into what we routinely do on behalf of ourselves, our children, our families, our communities, and ultimately our nation. The miles that lie ahead are the miles of translation. And the promise of what lifestyle could do for the human condition beckons from the far side. And for that reason, nobody gets to go to sleep anytime soon. We've got promises to keep, and there are miles to go. And we must make the journey, because the stakes of failure and staying here are just too high. These maps are courtesy of the CDC. My apologies to folks who are going to get toward a call is trying to see the slides, right? As the maps change color, the rates of obesity are rising. This is 1985. That's 1995. There's 2010. Pretty grim. That's the way it's been. And you can think of obesity as a canary in the coal mine of chronic disease. That's why we care about it so much. Where there's obesity, there is heart disease, cancer, stroke, dementia, and in particular, diabetes. So here are the trends in diabetes. Same basic story there. So by almost any measure, we've been in the frying pan for some time, and we're clearly headed toward the fire. The CDC projects that should current trends persist, by or about the middle of this century, one in three Americans will have diabetes. There are about 27 million diagnosed diabetics in the U.S. right now, one in three. It's over 100 million people. Think about the hullabaloo about health care reform, relevant topic in this building. Right? Much of the fuss is about money. I mean, whatever your politics, I think we'd all agree if no dollars were changing hands, everybody would be okay with almost any approach. It's money. It's always money, right? But here's the thing. Whatever your political inclinations, the whole damn thing is moot if we don't deal with this. There's no way to pay this bill. We're struggling now, right? Imagine a scenario where one in three of us has a chronic, serious, costly, potentially disabling disease beginning every younger. I don't think we'll be solvent. So whatever the mission we all signed up for, health, public health, public service, I think we find ourselves convened on the front lines of nothing less than homeland security here today. Because yes, our fates hang in the balance. Fate of our children hangs in the balance. Fate of our families and our communities hangs in the balance. But frankly, I think the fate of the nation hangs in the balance. I don't see a solvent 
United States of America when one in three of us has diabetes. Can't let it happen, folks. It's our job to prevent it. And unfortunately, it's a challenging task because we're already well on our way. The same sources that tell us these are the projections based on computer models tell us as we track data year by year, we're getting there just as fast as we predicted. So we've got to turn the Titanic around. And we have evidence that obesity is at least as big a problem among us as ever we thought. In a study published just last week in the American Journal of Public Health, these folks use this sophisticated analytical technique to reach the conclusion that obesity is responsible for one in five deaths in the United States, essentially killing one in five of us, something that we could prevent outright by eating well and being active. There is no rocket science involved here, right? Eat well, be active. We could prevent one in five premature deaths right there. And in working with Arkansas Children's Hospital and, and the folks who are collaborating here in Arkansas to confront these problems, the theme that emerges is health literacy. Literacy is real important because without it you can't read the writing on the wall. And we need to do that, right? despite all the crap we learned in high school. Got to read the writing on the wall. And the writing on the wall tells a tale of the plight our children are in and soon will be in. When I went to medical school, they taught us about two kinds of diabetes, juvenile onset and adult onset. Basically, it's on my watch that what used to be a chronic disease of overweight, sedentary, middle-aged adults evolved into a pediatric scourge. And our collective societal response when people under the age of 10 started getting adult onset diabetes was to change the name. I consider type 2 diabetes a euphemism. I consider it a name we applied because we really didn't want to confront the truth. This is adult onset diabetes. No child should ever get this disease. It is societal failure at the most egregious level. And it isn't where the story ends. When seven and eight year olds are getting what used to be adult onset diabetes, they will have had it for a decade by the time they turn 17 and 18. It simply stands to reason that those young people will start turning up in our ERs with angina pectoris and myocardial infarction. I know the story of a 17 year old boy who's had a triple coronary bypass. I occasionally hear about others like him. I shudder to think the day may dawn when angina is an adolescent rite of passage alongside acne. It sounds impossible, but when I went to medical school, adult onset diabetes in kids sounded just about as unlikely. And even as grim as this is, it gets worse. A 35% increase in the rate of stroke among children in the US age 5 to 14 has already been reported. And the only smoking gun on the scene to account for that is epidemic childhood obesity. Hard to imagine anything more unconscionable than a stroke in an 11-year-old that better use of feet and forks could have prevented outright. Folks, I'm sorry. Did you all have lunch just before this? Or you think about having lunch after? <laughs> I apologize for the indigestion. It's a bit of a lugubrious tale, right? Let's brighten things up. These are the dark clouds. We need to know about them. But what about the silver lining? I'm pleased to say there is one, and it's every bit as luminous as the clouds are dark. What if knowledge were power? What if we stopped at nothing to take what we have known these 20 years and turn it into what we routinely do in every community? Well, if that were the case, in that world, I could say to you, we could eliminate 80% of all heart disease. We could eliminate 90% of all diabetes. We could eliminate up to 60% of all cancer. I could say this to you, and I could cite peer-reviewed articles to back me up. In fact, you know what? I am saying this to you. I am citing peer-reviewed articles to back me up. And I'd like to know if by showing this slide, I brought a tear to any eye in the room. Or a lump to any throat, perhaps? Tearless, lumpless, insensitive bastards. <laughs> Well, maybe not. Maybe it's my fault. See, these are stunning statistics, arguably among the most stunning in the history of public health, and certifiably true. But at the end of the day, they're statistics. They're dull, they're dry, they're bland, 
and above all, they are anonymous. A message to the students here in public service. I've been in public health a long time and have long recognized that public health is encumbered by a potentially crippling fiction. For you see, there is no public. There's just you and me and everybody else. We need to part the veil of statistical anonymity, and I need your help. Let's peer under the veil at the private parts of public health. Audience participation moment. If you or someone you love, just you or someone you love, has been affected by heart disease, would you please raise your hand and keep it in the air? If you or someone you love has been affected by cancer and you don't have a hand in the air, please add your hand. If you or someone you love has been affected by either stroke or diabetes and you don't have one or both hands in the air, please add your hand. And folks, please look around the room, keep your hands in the air, and conjure to your mind's eye the face of one of those people you love. Now put your hands down, I'll be your proxy. Conjure to your mind's eye that face and remember the day you got that news. Phone call, email, text, trip to the hospital, the emergency room, the ICU, the CCU, whatever it was. I, I hope whoever it was got better and came home. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Either way, that was a bad day. For some of us, many such days, but if you pick one, it's a bad day. Bad phone call, bad trip, lots of anxiety and grief. Here's the thing. If knowledge were power, if we said, however arduous the miles, we will stop at nothing to fulfill the promise. If we used lifestyle as we know we could, eight out of 10 of us in this very room would not have had cause to put our hands in the air. That's what an 80% reduction in all chronic disease means. It's not vague. It's not remote. It's not about some public we don't know. It means eight times in 10, heart attacks don't occur, cancer isn't diagnosed, diabetes doesn't happen. You know, eventually we're all gonna die of something, right? But it means more years of life, more life in years until we go gentle into that good night. Those bad days don't happen eight times in 10. And we stand here and we look ahead at a fork in the road. Along one time is the future for our children where those bad days happen more often than ever they did at every younger age and we bequeath that to them. Or we take the other road, the road less traveled to date, and we bequeath to our children the world in which eight times in ten, those are good days. The phone call doesn't come. The bad thing doesn't happen. That's what it would mean if we eliminated 80% of chronic disease. It is not far away. We've all got skin in the game, the skin of people we love. When we part the veil of statistical anonymity, the faces we see looking back at us are the faces of people we know and the faces of people we love. It is for them the miles must be traversed. It is for them the promise of all this must be kept. And so, what on earth is the problem? We have the knowledge, we have the basis for passion, something rather monumental must have forestalled our progress all these years, and I submit to you humbly, something rather monumental has. In essence, if you take this and you add this, you get this <laughs> in much the same way as if you took this and added this, you would get this. And again, my apologies for folks who probably can't see the slides and think, what kind of talk is this, this, and this? What's he even talking about, right? Those poor folks around the corner over there, sorry. I give you the polar bear in the Sahara, my figurative trademark for the better part of 20 years. Uh, when my wife and I put this slide together, there was no imminent threat of this actually happening to polar bears. That may have changed in the intervening interval. Uh, you want to address that topic, you'll have to invite Al Gore. I'm sure I'd be only too happy to come to the Clinton School of Public Service. My topic's different. There's something wrong with this picture. Polar bears are beautifully adapted to one of the Earth's harshest climates, but specifically adapted to that climate. The very traits and tendencies that foster survival in the cold conspire against you in the heat. If you soak up and retain warmth where warmth is scarce, it keeps you alive. 
If you soak up and retain warmth under the burning Sahara sun in summer, it cooks your goose. All the same traits and tendencies, but their effect is altered by changing the environment. And of course, my case is, we are polar bears in the Sahara. Throughout most of human history, calories were relatively scarce and hard to get. We chased after them, had to hunt them down, and physical activity was unavoidable. It required neither gym membership nor specialized footwear. It was called survival and everybody did it every day. We have devised a modern world in which physical activity is scarce and hard to get and calories are unavoidable. We're drowning in them. Houston, we have a problem. And Little Rock and every place else. I submit to you that as a species, we have no native defenses against caloric excess or the lore of the couch never having needed them before. No native defenses, that is, save one. Great big homo sapien brains. We are arguably smarter than the average bear and can think our way out of this mess of our own devising. And that's just what we need to do. We need to think our way there. And I won't dwell on this for now, but I will simply point out we know where there is. Anybody in the room have a dog? You know what to feed your dog? Anybody have a horse by any chance? You know what to feed your horse? Anybody have tropical fish for crying out loud? You know what to feed your fish? Is it even remotely plausible that we'd have no idea what to feed homo sapiens? Right? It's not plausible. We are not clueless about the basic care and feeding of homo sapiens. Right? Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. We know where there is. If it glows in the dark, step away from the box and nobody will get hurt. Right? We are not clueless. So let's just leave it at that. We know what a healthy diet is. The challenge of healthy lifestyle is getting there from here. Let's talk about that. And to do so, I'll flip my metaphors. I began with the master levers of medical destiny. Let's now talk about a levee and the leverage it might provide. I like the levee metaphor. For one thing, what we're up against may be likened to a flood. A flood of highly processed, hyperpalatable, energy dense, nutrient dilute, glow in the dark, bet you can't eat just one kind of foods. A constant flow of marketing dollars encouraging us and our children to overconsume the very foods that propel us toward obesity and chronic disease. Wave after wave of technological advance giving us gadgets and gizmos that do all the things muscles used to do at work and at play. A great big obesogenic, morbidogenic flood. And if you want to contain a flood, you build a levee. I like the levee metaphor for a second reason. I've been at this a long time. It's partly why you invited me here. Supposedly, I know what I'm talking about, but the entire span of my 20-year career, the problem I'm trying to fix has gotten worse. I kind of suck. Or, in my dark moments when I'm thinking that, think about the levee. I think, you know, you can stack a lot of sandbags and still not have it be high enough and not feel like you're there yet but you gotta keep going. So on those darker days, I think, I'm not gonna build this whole thing myself. I'm not gonna build it all in any one day, but every day, I'm either part of the solution or I'm abdicating and I'm part of the problem. I'll stay in. I'll keep stacking sandbags. It keeps me going. It incrementalizes both the problem and the solution. And the third reason I like the levee metaphor is a precautionary tale. We are a quick fix silver bullet, active ingredient kind of society. I see this a lot, but in particular, if I do a TV appearance, like on the Dr. Oz show, in the aftermath of talking about vitamin D or vitamin B12 or Garcinia cambogia or green coffee bean extract or glutathione, you pick your poison. But in the aftermath of a segment on any one thing, I get a thousand emails from people who saw that and are now sold. This is the thing. Now, of course, yesterday it was a different the thing. Tomorrow it'll be a different the thing. And of course, folks, there is no the thing, right? It's like putting down one sandbag asking, are we dry yet? And the answer will be no. And concluding, well, I guess that was the wrong sandbag. Clearly, if we had the right one, it would be the thing. So are we dry yet? And the answer would again be no. And we actually do this. My colleagues and I have conducted systematic reviews and meta-analyses of the obesity prevention and control literature. We've looked from altitude. And we routinely are resting failure from the jaws of success because we do one program that makes good sense but then we ask the question, are we all dry yet? Was it enough? And it's never enough. No one thing is ever enough, but if we play that foolish game, we're gonna get nowhere. If we take soda out of schools and then ask, are all the kids lean and healthy now? And the answer is no. The Beverage Association will step forward promptly to say, see, I told you so, put it back in. 
Okay? But what we're really dealing with here is a causal pathway of factors, and we have to interrupt them systematically and comprehensively. Toss any one intervention at this, however good, it's like throwing one sandbag onto a floodplain. Everything will just flow around it. If we want to stop the flow, we are in the levee building enterprise, and I hope I can count on you. Now, I've been metaphorical and I've been philosophical up until now. Let's get practical, because at the end of the day, we've got to do the work. We've got to get our hands on these sandbags. So what do they look like? Well, first, let's get the encouraging news that if we build it, results apparently will come. We had a recent report that rates of childhood obesity are actually starting to decline in at least some locations. Talk more about this later if you like, but some good news there. And similarly, some good news on the adult front where the latest obesity report shows rates of adult obesity stabilizing nationally in all states but one. Mm. Sorry, folks. Yeah, so last year obesity rose in one state only and we're all standing in it. We're sitting in it, okay? There it is. But we can deal with that. So I'm a sandbagger this stage of my career. This is what I do. Manufacture, test, stack, and as appropriate, attempt to disseminate sandbags. The practical stuff. The stuff that can really make a difference right now. So for instance, we learned not too long ago in the Journal of the American Medical Association that 20 minutes of physical activity five times a week could be the difference between at-risk kids developing type 2 diabetes or not. A high percentage of at-risk kids could be spared type 2 diabetes with 20 minutes of physical activity five days a week. 20 minutes out of a day is 1.39% of the minutes in a day. 20 minutes five times a week out of the minutes in a week, 0.99%, less than 1% of weekly minutes. Talk about an ROI. Invest less than 1% of a kid's weekly minutes, and they dodge the bullet of diabetes. But this at a time when schools are jettisoning phys ed and recess because they've got no time for that stuff, right? So that's where we find ourselves. That's a fixable problem. Right? We can call on this human ingenuity of ours and reconcile the square peg to the round hole. I'm tired of hearing that no child left behind is the reason why all the children are being left on their behinds. We can fix that, right? So I'll spare you the anecdote which involves my son, Gabriel. Uh, my wife and I have five children four daughters and a son. We came out of retirement at Catherine's suggestion to try one more time and see if I could produce a Y chromosome, which it turns out I can under circumstances I'm not prepared to discuss. <laughs> uh, we got my son Gabe, and some years ago, he's 14 now, but when he was a little guy and very rambunctious and bouncing off walls, he was at a talk I was giving and driving his mother crazy, fidgeting out of his seat, and in the end, the only solution was to have him get up and run laps around the auditorium. And before the whole thing was over, about 35 kids were doing just the same. Every kid in the auditorium under the age of about 12 got up and ran laps around the auditorium. This program was born that day. ABC for Fitness Activity Burst in the Classroom. It's a comprehensive program of brief structured activity bursts any teacher can dole out to kids right in the classroom, three to eight minutes at a time throughout the day when the kids are unteachable anyway. It doesn't take a second away from teaching because this is during the sit still, keep your hands to yourself, do not pull that, don't throw that, wake up, pay attention time. Turn that time into physically active time, and accumulate 30 minutes every day. That's not optimal, but it's a floor. We can get every kid above the floor. And this program is freely available and widely disseminated. Probably sounds like a good idea. Oh, and by the way, we got together with experts in pedagogy so that the activity bursts are matched to grade level and subject matter. So teachers can teach during the activity burst, and potentially you can actually add 30 minutes of teaching time every day, because the downtime is now uptime. Right? Well, sounds like a good idea, but I'm a scientist. We can't trust good ideas. We have to verify. We conducted a controlled intervention in 1,000 kids. Half got ABC for fitness, half got business as usual. We saw significant improvement in key measures of fitness, stable performance on all standardized tests, decreased behavioral problems in the classroom. Fewer kids were sent to the principal, significant reduction in all medication use, significant reduction in medication use for asthma specifically, and a 33% reduction in medication use for ADHD. The proper remedy for rambunctiousness is recessed amet, not Ritalin. We take naturally rambunctious kids, send them to school, bolt them to chairs all day long so they can grow up to become adults. We can't get off couches with crowbars, and when they act up along the way, we medicate them. Folks, we gotta fix that, right? ABC for Fitness is a sandbag in the levee. It's available to everybody for free. 
And it's part of a bigger story. The CDC has analyzed school-based physical activity programs and has demonstrated that consistently they either preserve or enhance academic achievement. Sound mind, sound body should sound familiar. Is this the kind of sensible advice our grandparents gave us and we forgot about it somewhere along the line? And at the cutting edge of randomized clinical trials, we're finding our way back to the future. They were right about it all the time. If we build the right kind of new age recess, reading, writing, arithmetic, and recess are synergistic, not competitive, and we have an excellent example taking hold right here in Arkansas, courtesy of Health Teacher, which is helping to disseminate health literacy programming and health improvement programming throughout the state, and they have a physical activity program called Go Noodle. So kids in Arkansas will be beneficiaries of this sandbag in the levee. Everywhere we took ABC for Fitness, we started getting questions about the grown-ups, what about us? And I'll be brisk to get us through here, but we built a program for you. ABE for Fitness, Activity Bursts Everywhere. It's a library of videos accessible for free. Activity Bursts you can do while wearing business attire, at home, living room, waiting room, at a desk, while seated if you want. And we broke them out so you could decide I want to do a lower body routine, an upper body routine. And these are designed to take place in the course of routine daily events. So you could do six five minute activity bursts, there's your 30 minutes on those days you don't have time to get to the gym or go for a walk or do your thing before or after work. And we can fit fitness in and it's our job to build the tools that empower people to do exactly that. On the nutrition side we have a food label literacy program, ties right in with the theme here of health literacy, called Nutrition Detectives. Are there any Michael Pollan fans in the room? Pollan tells us what? Eat food, not too much, mostly plants, right? Excellent advice. But you're at the supermarket and you're standing in the cereal aisle. Does it help? Which cereal in which box is more food, mostly plants, than which other cereal in which box, right? It's excellent advice, but not entirely actionable where the rubber hits the road. How about this? The shorter the ingredient list, the better. Designed to work where the rubber hits the road, right? So Nutrition Detectives is, an, is a 90-minute free DVD available in English and Spanish that ultimately distills down to five clues that fit on a refrigerator magnet like the shorter the ingredient list, the better. Stuff that eight-year-olds can remember. And here, too, we proved it. And by the way, th this program has traction all over the world. Most recently, we heard about uptake in public schools in Mumbai, India. And it's actually been tested in Moscow, and we know it works well across cultures. So it's pretty robust. We conducted our own intervention study in 1,200 families. We saw significant improvement in food label literacy of the kids we taught. No great surprise. Here's the surprise. We saw a significant improvement in the food label literacy. In other words, the ability to identify a more nutritious from a less nutritious food in mom and dad, in the parents of the kids we taught. We didn't talk to mom and dad. We just infected their kids with knowledge and sent the little vectors home to do the rest of the job. <laughs> That's a beautiful example of how we can reach and transform families, right? If we get good programming into schools, we can educate the parents as well. I mean, our kids are the ones who talk to us about seat belts and smoke detectors and stop, drop, and roll. There's no reason why they can't be in the vanguard of health promotion. Very often, we gather and we think about our responsibility as adults to take care of children, and we're not wrong. But they're powerful agents of change, and they too can be part of the solution. So we use them just that way with nutrition detectives. And again, that's a sandbag in the levee and it's available for free. We're working now on programming to reach the hard to reach middle school group. You now they don't want to hear about cute clues that fit on a refrigerator magnet, but they like YouTube plenty. So we're developing a music video program, three minute long hip hop music videos like Unjunk Yourself and The Process. We've been processing food and now we're processing you. We're here to climb in your mind where we'll control what you chew. We want to stir up a little bit of righteous indignation. Features my kids, by the way, who are excellent dancers. So check this out on YouTube. Unjunk yourself for the process. And we hope particularly in collaboration with Health Teacher to create a whole library of these music videos and a curriculum out of it. We think there's enormous opportunity to reach hard to reach kids this way. And when we're reaching kids, we want to make them part of the solution. We transformed school lunches nationwide this year, and a lot of the kids revolted. Right? We found in Connecticut, when we implemented a nutrition guidance system and talked to the kids about the changes that were coming and made them part of the process, they were much more accepting. They said, oh, okay, I get it. I see what, what the difference is here, and, and that actually matters to me. And I think there's an opportunity to accelerate construction of the levy by thinking interinstitutionally. Businesses are investing in wellness because they can't afford this. 
This is an $1,800 office chair. And in some of the conferences I've attended in the heartland, I've seen these. Right? They hold up 600-pound people, and there are more and more of those around. Right? But no business can afford $1,800 office chairs. And so they're investing in wellness programming, not because it's nice. It is nice. But because they've got no choice. Because generally they get an ROI. It costs less to cultivate wellness than to deal with stuff like this. But when you talk to schools about wellness programming, they often say, we can't do it. Got no resources. Got no money. Got no time. Got no space. Don't have the expertise, right? But what about businesses adopting schools? What about chambers of commerce adopting schools? To some extent, you have that model with Arkansas Children's Hospital working with schools already. But we could extend beyond the healthcare se sector. Why not all businesses adopting schools? Because after all, worksite wellness is to reduce cost, and those kids who are developing adult onset diabetes more and more routinely are the financial dependents of the workers. The employers pay in those bills too. And besides, what happens at the worksite may stay at the worksite. Your employer teaches you about eating well and being physically active, but you go home to a kid who pulls on your elbow and says, Mom, I want the one with SpongeBob on it. You're going to have the one with SpongeBob on it in your pantry. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's going to call your name, right? Parents and children will get to health together, or probably not at all. No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. Well, no woman either, no child. We're all in this together. John Dunn pretty much nailed it, and the bell is tolling for us all. We've got to help families get to help. So I propose this initiative, BOSS, Businesses Applying Wellness Strategies in Schools. Businesses already adopt stretches of highway, right? Drive down a highway, this three-mile stretch of interstate is brought to you litter-free courtesy of. Let's have them adopt schools. Let's have them sponsor wellness programming because they can save money doing it and be good corporate citizens and get good PR and everybody can win. It'll help us build the levy. In some instances, the need is so extreme that conventional resources aren't enough. We need extraordinary resources. Here's an example of one. It's a boarding school in South Carolina called Mindstream Academy. Its resources are focused on severe teen obesity. There are two problems there, by the way. Severe teen obesity doesn't just mean the complications of obesity. It generally means the addition of insult to injury every day. Those kids are bullied and derided and persecuted. And so in the real world, they eat too much of all the wrong things, but then they get picked on for being fat, and the only friend they've got left is the very same food that made them fat in the first place, and they eat more, and it gets worse, and it leads to despair. Mindstream leads away from that, creates a community of understanding, provides all the forms of therapy these kids need, live in chef, dietitian, personal trainers. We, we partnered with a public school district in Missouri. Thirteen kids spent a semester at Mindstream. They lost a collective 756 pounds. No gimmickry. They just learned healthy living skills. Healthy living takes skill. It's not just about willpower. It's about skill power, and skills can be acquired. One of the kids lost over 100 pounds. And what they find is even more important, self-esteem and purpose and the opportunity to dream again. This resource should be available. I told the clinicians this morning at the Children's Hospital that we are either part of the solution or part of the problem. So we built an online training program to help make sure that we add the right things to this recipe. Compassionate and constructive counseling. It's called OUCH, Online Weight Management Counseling for Healthcare Professionals. It's a free CME program if I do have any clinician colleagues in the room. Help yourselves. It's based on 15 years of behavior modification research in our shop. And here's the URL, and I'll be leaving my slides behind so you don't have to write this stuff down. You can get access to it. I think we also need to design weight loss programs for adults that are family friendly. They should be about eating well, not just losing weight, but finding health. It's irresponsible to go on a diet and leave your children behind. But we need to design programs that allow you to go on a diet if you need to and teach your children healthy eating into the bargain. I've helped to build one called Way Forward. It's available in Texas now, but it will disseminate nationally soon. And then finally, as we take stock of the sandbags and the levee, my wife, Catherine, I mentioned before, has a PhD in neuroscience from Princeton University. She's the brains of the operation, but even she can't pick out a bread. I say, Catherine, buy the most nutritious bread. And she says, I don't know which is the most nutritious bread. Bread A has the most fiber, but also the most sodium. So I don't know if the trade-off's good or bad. Bread B doesn't have quite as much sodium, and fiber's close, 
but it's got high fructose corn syrup. It's kind of down the ingredient list. It's not very much, but is it better or worse than bread A? I can't tell. And bread C doesn't have the added sugar, and the sodium's not too bad, and the fiber's pretty decent, and it's the only one that says zero grams trans fat right there on the front of the pack, but it's also the only one that says in parentheses in the middle of the ingredient list may contain one or more of the following, and there's partially hydrogenated oil in there, and I know that's trans fat, and I don't know if it's in there, but it could be. And then there's bread D, which is a multi-grain with amber waves of grain on the packaging, but it's got the least fiber of all. I'm not sure any one of them is actually a whole grain. In 2003, I told Secretary of Health Tommy Thompson this story and said, Mr. Secretary, with all due respect, if a PhD in neuroscience from Princeton is not enough to pick out a loaf of bread, I think you guys set the bar just a little too high. Here's what we need to do. Convene a multidisciplinary panel of top-notch experts in nutrition and public health and turn what we know into stuff anybody can understand. Create GPS for nutrition so nobody gets lost. Well, the feds didn't do it. I lost my patients and colleagues, and I did. I convened a panel of luminaries in nutrition, the chair of nutrition at Harvard, the inventor of the glycemic index, past president of the American Diabetes Dietetic Associations, uh, the inventor of volumetrics, and on and on it went. And we built the overall nutritional quality index algorithm, takes into account about 30 nutritional factors, weighs them based on their influence on health, and spits out a number between 1 and 100. The higher the number, the more nutritious the food. And it's called NuVal. That's how it sees daylight. It's a public-private partnership at this point. And we think it's GPS for nutrition. They've scored over 100,000 foods. We've studied it extensively. The most important study was done at Harvard, 100,000 people. All the foods they ate were given NuVal scores. The higher the average NuVal scores of their diets, the lower the rate of cardiovascular disease the lower the rate of diabetes, the lower their body mass index, and the lower the rate of premature death from any cause whatsoever. We can improve length and quality of life by improving diet one well-informed choice at a time. And if you want to put a face to these benefits, Sally Galvin is a wife and mother of two, shops in a store that's got new value. And by the way, it goes on the shelf tag, on the price, right next to the price in front of all the foods. So she shops in a hy V store in Iowa, I think, where they have Nuval, and over 18 months, Sally lost 115 pounds. All she did was trade up her groceries. No program, no money, no nothing. One of the many virtues of more nutritious foods is they help us fill up on fewer calories. But the food industry said, bet you can't eat just one. Our answer back with Nuval is, want to bet? Right? If you eat the right foods, that's exactly what they do. They fill you up on fewer calories. And the beauty of this approach is it's family friendly. Her husband lost weight and got healthier. Her kids lost weight and got healthier. She didn't leave them out. She brought them along for the ride. Sandbag in the levee. Nuval's in about 1,700 supermarkets nationwide, including some here in Arkansas, reaching about 30 million shoppers. It's my signature sandbag at this point. And one of the important things about this, if we're going to help people buy more nutritious food, is the cost. I won't spend much time here except to say we've actually studied this. And the notion that more nutritious food always costs more is urban legend. We've all said it so many times, we believe it has to be true. Produce is pricey. But in every aisle of the supermarket, there are more nutritious choices that do not cost more. We've studied it. We've published the data. The problem is people are not literate to nutrition. They don't know which the more nutritious foods are. Remember that multi-grain bread that confused my wife? That costs a premium. Right? And all that packaging is what you're paying for. It's actually not more nutritious, but it looks like it is. Talk about adding insult to injury. It's pseudo-nutrition, and you're charged extra for it. Low-fat peanut butter. Nobody eats low-fat peanut butter thinking it's going to taste better, right? Eat low-fat peanut butter because you think it's better for you. It's not. They take out a little bit of healthy, unsaturated oil, make copious additions of sugar and salt. It's much less nutritious, and into the bargain, you get to pay more for it. There's a lot of that going on. But while it's good that more nutritious food doesn't always cost more, I have a dream about how much better we could do. Because we can score nutritional quality objectively and correlate it with health outcomes. What about financial incentives uniformly attached to nutritional quality? Think about the SNAP program, food stamps, right? We want to talk about public service. We collectively send about $100 billion a year to the feds to underwrite SNAP, contentious issue these days. It's why the farm bill is snarled, but let's not go there. I'm, I'm a left-leaning public health type, right? Big surprise there. I support SNAP. But here's the reality. We send $100 billion a year to the feds to help poor people eat poor food to get poor health. We then spend a ton more money through Medicaid to pay the costs of all that poor health. Who in this scenario is winning? We lose, they lose, the government loses, everybody loses. 
What if we said we're going to objectively score all the foods, put them in categories, put them into quartiles or quintiles, and the higher the nutritional rating in any given category, the less it's going to cost you. We're going to put a financial incentive so you buy a bread in the bottom quartile of scores, your dollar's worth a dollar. You buy a bread in the next quartile, your dollar's worth a dollar twenty-five. The next, a dollar fifty, the top two dollars. We wouldn't have to prevent too much diabetes or bariatric surgery to pay for a program like that ten times over. So now the shopper wins, taxpayer wins, and the government wins because they've saved a ton of money. Everybody wins. And if this works in the public sector, and I think it would, why not the private sector? Why not insurance companies or self-insured employers doing deals with supermarkets saying, we'll help you offer Nuvel, we'll put a financial incentive into your loyalty card program because we're paying for the diabetes care. And if we prevent a little bit of diabetes, our profit margins will go up. You're providing nutrition guidance and financial incentives to your shoppers, and they're getting paid to get healthy. Everybody in this scenario wins. Right? I see a very bright future for health promotion if we latch on to these win-win scenarios. There are more sandbags on the assembly line back at home, and right here in Arkansas, again, just to highlight this relationship, health teachers actively engaged in disseminating school-based health promotion programming throughout the state, and I think that's a very fortuitous partnership and bright with promise. So here we are then, having let health languish for far too long on a road too little traveled. We'd like to see it move along a path of substantially lesser resistance. My belief is we can, in fact, get out of the dark wood, but maybe only if we see the forest through the trees. Or perhaps that's the elephant in the room. It was six men of Indistan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each by observation might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling of the tusk, cried, Ho, what have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to meet is mighty clear. This wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant, is very like a snake. The fourth reached out an eager hand and felt about the knee, what most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, Even the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth, no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within his scope, I see, quoth he, the elephant, is very like a rope. And so these men of Indistan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right and all were in the wrong. So often theologic wars, the disputants I ween, tread on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. My friends, I fear we're prone to much the same tendency in epidemiology, but from the start it was my intention to make the case for good invention. For where there's a will, there's a way to be paved so the health of our families can be righted and saved. And I'm confident we can all escape our doom if we just see the elephant or possibly the polar bear here in the room. Thank you all very much. We've got time for a couple of questions. Uh, if anyone would like to raise your hand, yes, we have right here. There's a microphone coming right at you. Okay, so the, the question pertains to Nuval and the pushback that, you know, obviously we're telling, you know, one to a hundred, you can guess that, well, some stuff scores a one, right? Like Coca-Cola and Pepsi. So high profit margin item, high sale item. One of the reasons we took this to retail grocers initially rather than food manufacturers was that very issue. So the manufacturers want to sell what they make. The supermarkets want market share and they want to sell what people are buying. And you know, their portfolio is already 50,000 food products. 
and they can be fairly nimble. Now, they have relationships with the big manufacturers, and we've experienced that. So, you know, if we make Kraft unhappy, everybody gets a little edgy. Uh, although one of the grocers that offers Nuval in several of its banners is Kroger, and they're a $90 billion company, so they can push back pretty good. But you're absolutely right. Why isn't Nuval in every supermarket? Well, because it costs money to implement it, because profit margins are very slender for retailers, and because they're a little trepidatious about, well, we're going to discourage people from buying some of the stuff that either we want to sell or the manufacturers we have a relationship want to sell. So the manufacturers are much more resistant. The big manufacturers have tried in various ways to kill us, and it was very important to make the science pretty bulletproof from the start. Interestingly, a lot of the PhD nutritionists that the big nutrition companies hire did their thesis training with somebody who was on the panel that helped me build the Anki, and that wasn't accidental. So, you know, it was a little hard to throw stones at your thesis advisor, that kind of thing. But they've looked for various ways to try and kill us, including lawsuits and, and sort of um, shell uh, companies. So they found an organization, which is the one that comes after us, so we don't really know who's doing it. So there is a fair amount of resistance. Ultimately, it's in the service of the consumer. And personally, I think it ought to be a free app. There is an app where you can scan a barcode and get a Nuval score. I'd like to see that in everybody's hands, interactive website. And I'd, you know, I'd like the truth to prevail. And then, so you know, we'll see if we get there. It's a struggle. But ultimately, manufacturers, retailers, they constitute part of the food supply. One of the mistakes I think we make, we talk about the food supply as if it's the Himalayas, you know, as if it's this immutable aspect of the landscape. What we often fail to consider is that it is highly responsive to the food demand. And to prove that point, just remember what happened at the, the height of the Atkins craze. No legislation, no policy, but every supermarket in the country filled up with low-carb foods. Most of them were crap, by the way, but they were low-carb crap because people wanted to buy low-carb foods. What if everybody simply wanted to buy more nutritious foods? You know, we could vote at every cash register in the country. So my primary agenda is to empower a change in the demand, knowing that then the supply will take care of itself. If we win the hearts of the consumers, nobody can withstand us in our righteous might. And if we don't, then the resistance of the supermarkets will be the beginning of the end. All right. Yes. We have a question right back over here. I'm sure I'm not the only mature adult who does exercise, doesn't smoke, and knows what she should eat. But she cheats, and so she carries around an extra 20 pounds. So there, it's not just a matter of knowing what you're supposed to do. Clearly, knowledge is in power. But first of all, good for you. You exercise, mostly eat well, don't smoke. Are you healthy? Oh, but, the, yeah, but I, I think you're beautiful. Health is beautiful. Vitality is beautiful. So, so there's the good news. You're healthy. Now, so you've got these 20 pounds that you might not want, and you could lose them, but the question is, is it worth it? And only you can decide that. And I tell every patient I see, you're the boss, right? I, my job is to empower you with options, but you are the boss. I am not the boss of you. So, you know, I could tell you, here's what it would take to lose 20 pounds. Is it worth it? If, you know, one of the things we tend to forget, and, and you know, my clan in particular, you come see doctors and, you know, we wag our fingers and tell you what you should do, and, and we're right, because you have to do this stuff to be healthy. But we stop there as if health is the prize. Health isn't the prize. Health is a currency you get to spend on the prize. You know what the prize is? Living. Living is the prize. Living the way you want to live, that's the prize. If you're living the way you want to live, and you're doing more of that now with the extra 20 pounds, than you would be doing if you suffered to lose the 20 pounds, then sister, you keep going, you're, you're fine. If you would be a happier person taking off the 20 pounds, then you should struggle to do it, not because anybody says you should, but because it would add pleasure to your life. But you know, the simple fact is that we were all lean all the time in a world where it was impossible to gain weight. Calories were scarce and hard to get, physical activity was unavoidable. In this world, it's easier to get fat than to stay thin, that's all there is to it. You're doing very well. Many people don't do as well. But here's the thing. We want to empower everybody to do as well as they can, and we want to make changes in the environment so that physical activity is just part of everybody's day wherever we go, healthy food choices. One final comment based on your question. So you, you mentioned cheating. 
you know, I suppose in a sense I, I cheat too. My, my wife makes these delicious chocolate chip cookies and all that. But uh, actually, Skip was kind enough to mention uh, at his intro, rehabilitating taste buds. And we talked about this last night. Taste buds are very malleable little fellas. When they don't get to hang out with the foods they love, they learn to love the foods they're with. And if you transition to healthier foods, you come to prefer healthier foods. And if you do that item by item, then even cheating is better cheating. So, you know, my cheating is dark chocolate, which is actually good for me. And my wife's homemade cookies are whole grain cookies with dark chocolate and walnuts. And there are a lot of calories there, but they're really nutritious. And so, you know, again, you can probably improve even the quality of your cheating, and maybe you have already, and that's why you're healthy. In which case, yeah, we want to strike a balance between the pleasure we get from the food we eat and the pleasure we get from good health. And you know, I think the prize here is loving food that loves us back. But if you're living well and you feel good, you just you keep you got it going on, sister. Don't give it up. Got time for one more question right here on the front table. Wait for the microphone, please. I'm a family physician, and I'm chagrined about how little medical knowledge we get like this taught in our medical schools today. And if you look at some statistics, and by the way, I've got a talk on obesity, and it's called the elephant in the room. Yes, <laughs> but if you look at primary care physicians today, less than half of them ever bring up the fact that someone is obese. Right. So to address that issue, I, I'm currently writing the third edition of a nutrition textbook called Nutrition and Clinical Practice. So you know, I, I put countless hours of work where that passion is trying to teach medical students, residents, and docs in practice about how to address this. We built the OUCH program. We've conducted studies adapting behavior change to primary care, making it easy and quick. You can counsel effectively in increments as short as two minutes. That's what OUCH is, in, is designed to help people do. And we offer free CME credit to try and get people to line up. But, but, you know, I have some colleagues who want us to own this. You know, Medicare's reimbursing for weight management counseling. That, that, that whole space is taking off, right? The medicine that needs to be applied to the problem of epidemic obesity is cultural medicine. It's not clinical medicine. We kind of come in late in the game. We are either part of the solution or part of the problem. We should be part of the solution. All of our colleagues should be trained accordingly. But we'll never be a big part of the solution. That's why we've been so late to the party. Because frankly, you know, what people have for dinner isn't a clinical issue, is it? And the opportunities they have throughout the day, every day, to be physically active or not isn't really a clinical issue. So the best medicine here is cultural medicine. We need to appreciate that we should value, we should revere health like wealth. We should raise children who aspire to being as healthy as possible, not just rich, to raise our kids differently. We have to think about loving food that loves us back. We have to recognize that the sole construction material for the growing bodies of children and grandchildren we love is the food they eat. Where did junk food enter the picture? How did we ever develop a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, isn't it cute attitude toward using junk to construct the growing bodies of children we love, right? So we need a cultural transformation. And if we can achieve that, docs will have their place as a small part of a comprehensive solution. Part of the reason docs don't want to play right now is it's the way we approach it. It's as if our culture can do everything wrong and then you need to fix it. And frankly, we know we can't do that. So I think a lot of people just say, I'm just not going to talk about it. It's too big. And they're not wrong. But again, we can't abdicate either. So I'm, I'm doing what I can to try and help us get in the game. Let's, uh, let's give a round of applause to Dr. David Katz. Thank you.